I'm just working, man. I know what my audience is like. I did some independent films with Master P, and a lot of those movies did really well. Mm -hmm. I'm ambitious, I'm a hustler. I have my own lane. That's the thing about comedy. You wake up every day, you don't know if you're funny that day. This guy right here is a legend in TV and radio and, and all around media. Uh, you might remember his name and his voice from BET in the early days uh, and also now from Rap Radar, uh, a couple of radio stations up and down the East Coast, a big time music programmer for the network, the BET network in the 80s uh, and just a very vocal personality on music and the game in general. He's got a book out. It's called Blackout. My 40 years in the music business. Please, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the program. New friend of the family, Paul Porter. Paul, man, big brother. Thank, thank, thank you, Lamont, man. How are you, bro? You trying to age I'm good. Me, man. I was at BET in the 90s and early 2000s, man. I, I don't want to oh. be that old yet. Yeah, okay. You 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 at the <laughs> radio station, that, that unnamed radio station in yeah. the 80s. So my bad. I had to feel <laughs> yeah, yeah. The Capitan. What did, what did Donnie used to call you? El Capitan? Yeah, well, I, the, I the put ca the L in there, man. As I, yeah. I, I, I branched into uh, my Latin community, but yeah, the, he, he, he dubbed me the captain back in the day. Yeah. <laughs> captain. Paul Porter. Paul Porter. So you're originally from uh, 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 Boston, I believe. And, and I went to school in Boston. I, I I'm from Queens, Jamaica Funk, Queens. John Brown, man. Yeah, Queens. So okay. I went to school right. in Boston and migrated to D.C. Right, 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 right. Now, now, what brought you to D.C. in those early years? NBC and Donnie Simpson, and you know, back in the day, man, that was a big job. I went from making ten thousand to seventy thousand. That was the early '80s when they had unions and good pay <laughs> yeah unions and good pay and 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 when work was fun um oh, i was man. i got you right i got a chance i got a chance to 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 you know read through the book uh blackout my 40 years in the in the music industry and I, and i gotta tell you it was an easy read and i don't know if i'm partial because of my experience um starting off in radio straight out of college uh, that made it that much more interesting and 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 relatable, um, but the stories you tell. I mean, you 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 you've got a hell of a resume, and you know a, a hell of a collection of stories, and, and and when you look at the end of it, you're like, man, you survived all of that. What does it look like on the other side to you? What does the game look like? What does music and entertainment look like for somebody that spent forty years in it? Well, uh, you know, it's funny, man. Going back in time, music was so powerful, man. And, and mm -hmm. music has sort of lost its power. It's more of an event now than it is a love of music. You know, like the the songs we hear today, the Cardi and Megan and Watt, they burn out so quickly. But we used to love artists and bands for a long time. So... So musically, I'm deprived. Like the song that, that changed my life I talk about in the book was when I was growing up in Queens, I used to ride my bike by James Brown's house. And back then, we were Negroes. And when Say It Loud, I'm Black and I'm Proud came out, I've been black ever since. And, mm. and getting those the, the, the power in songs now, it's just, it's just different, man. It's sort of like a quick burn. I got my own radio station down here in our Orlando, The Wire, and I play hip hop and R and B still. And you know, I'm 60 years old, but uh, I, I love the art form. But you know, the message and the messengers are just different now. You know, it's it's sort of sad to me because music can be empowering. It's always been for Black folks, and it, it's it's not the same anymore. Now this is a this is kind of a softball question, but you know you said you're 60, so you saw you saw the birth of hip hop of that genre. When mm -hmm. and how did it change? 
in your opinion? You know, it's funny, man. It, it, you know, in the 80s, when hip-hop sort of broke, we, we were still telling stories, you know, the public enemies and the Chuck D's. And then in the 90s, once gangster rap and I got, got over the BET, we started you know, the balance was sort of gone. Like, you know, back in the day, man, love songs were always number one. The Commodores, yeah. Earth, Wind and yeah. Fire, and Luther Vandross. Like, you know, I, you know, I grew up as an only child, so I got my game off of, like, records, you know. So now it's just different. It's, you know, it's, it, it's a quick burn. Now we whopping every day. And, um, you know, there's still a lot of artists that have powerful messages in the music, but they don't get the same exposure because supposedly the audience doesn't want that. But I call that BS. Now, as a, as your days, uh, back to your days at BET, you were a music programmer. And for, yeah, for those program director talent, mm -hmm. for those that, that don't understand what that is, um, you were responsible for pretty much what we saw airing on the channel. Yeah, indeed, um, man. Yeah. So, so what type of challenges did you face back then? With, uh, you know, with being somebody in the, you were essentially a gatekeeper as far as the video content was concerned. So, what what were some of the things that you were up against back in those days, sitting in that seat? Well, well, well it's funny when I when I took over as program director at BET, there was just like a lot of garbage. We had like thirteen hundred videos, and I reduced it down to two hundred. And the labels, they moaned, they groaned, but our ratings went up. You know, this was before the sale of Viacom. And, and, and you know, I, I just made a lot of changes. And we, at the time, BET was in 66 million homes. And when I took over at BET, I knew the game had changed. I checked into my hotel, and that, that, that next Saturday, I got a FedEx, and it had $30,000 in cash, three envelopes, $100 bills in it. And I was like, damn, this game has changed. Before it was, you know, movies and yeah. concerts and parties. <laughs> Tickets. And then it just <laughs> turned, in, it, it, it turned into cold cash. And, mm. uh, <laughs> you know, and that's how the business is run. We're in a capitalistic society. Right. And, uh, you know, people just don't understand the the business side. You know, there's a, there, there was like $11 billion in the music industry. Anyway, there's so much money in the industry, right. and everybody thinks they can zoom to the top. But there's just so many hands that got to get paid. So so when you you get there and, and, and that type of money is, is floating your way, um, you know, people on the outside looking in, they, they, you know, a lot of people to this day still don't realize that that w is what was taking place back then. Um, there was a reason why you saw a video 10 times in an hour. There was a reason why uh, a certain song was was played uh, 20 times a day. And, and that reason was was money, for lack of a better word. Oh, oh, oh definitely. I mean, that's what drives it. it. You could have the greatest song and you'll never hear it. I mean, I, I, I see it. To this day, I mean, it's funny when the Cardi B and Megan song came out last Friday, it broke all types of records. You know, I looked up the numbers and the spins, you know, certain stations were playing it every hour on the hour. And, right. and that's not by coincidence. <laughs> you know, there's not like 500 programmers that do the same thing because songs are so good. It's, you know whose hands, you know, I always say programmers' hands are like cups. You know, they're always asking for something. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's like metal cups, you know. And I used right. to hear about it and see it, but once I took over at BET, I really saw it. But then, you know, the powers that be sort of were upset at me because they were making, you know, $100,000 videos and I wasn't playing them because they were garbage. But as right. the ratings went up and, and the station BET did better, you know, it, it, it was a good thing, at least for the network. Now, it, it, now this is funny to me. Um, 
you at the beginning of the book it's called blackout 40 uh my 40 years in the music industry uh by paul porter um I, at the beginning of the book you you make a statement this is this is a a work of nonfiction. the stories are true but some of the names and 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 situations you know have been have been changed mm-hmm. and then when i get to the book like i recognize every name <laughs> and i'm like you, except you, you na- two. Except two. <laughs> okay, yeah. okay. You you named yeah. everybody, and um, one of the stories that you told was about Donnie Simpson, the great Donnie Simpson, and you were saying how you know in the midst of everything that was going on in the in the game at that time, and how the game was played and what you did, you said Donnie Simpson was one of those individuals who, uh, from your vantage point, always kept his nose clean. Yeah, and. So my question to you is, how did you, with all of that energy around you, how did you, how did you navigate that? Because you, you obviously have a conscious then and now, um, but you were in the seat. So how were you able to navigate and, 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 and stay out of the way, but at the same time be influential and impactful enough to get your job done? Well, I, I think it was Donnie that sort of inspired me because Donnie mm. was just different, you know, but Donnie was making a lot of money. And a oh, lot true. of people in radio don't make hundreds of thousands of dollars. So he had a sense of freedom. He trusted me. He said, play this, do this. I give him this. And it was that. And, and then later on in my career, I started going different places. And, you know, I felt helpless. And, you know, I, I, I got orders. You know, I got orders at BET to play this because, Def Jam was spending three million dollars a year at the sales department, and I'm like, this is trash. Play it, and I used to get into those battles. Don't think it it, it didn't come with stress and pain. You know, I started Kathy yeah. Hughes and Radio One in a in a trail on Fourth and Eight. We went from mm. a zero to number four in nine months. I remember the day Kathy Hughes made her first million dollars and she was happy, but you know, but things have changed, man. It's a corporate world right now and and that's okay. But I'm, I'm more into, and I don't want to say consciousness, but Mm -hmm. I know how important music is for us. And, you know, we've always fell in love with songs and artists. But, you know, the industry doesn't build them the same way anymore. Uh, like I said, it's a quick burn, quick fatigue. Now, you, you, know, you talked about corporations and, and, and um, you know, these, these, these companies being run by certain people. Now, the elephant in the room, with respect to that part of the conversation, is always the same. Um, you talk about black-owned businesses. You mentioned Radio 1, and we're talking about BT. Do you, in your opinion, um, just based on what you've seen, were they in better shape when they were black owned and operated or when the larger white companies came in and took them over? Oh, I think BET was much better in the early days. I mean, we had different programming. We had balance. We had team summit. We had shows for different audiences. And, you know, as, uh, uh, as once you go public, it's about stock earnings. It's not about listeners. And, you know, it, it's how to, how to reach the most people at one time. And, and, and I don't think they're always right, but that's why, you know, I've had this long different path, you know, it, it's, it's just not enough substance for me, not, not enough caring and, and it keeps happening now. I hear these debates all the time about, you know, black owned and black businesses. But like I, I call it selective amnesia. We, okay. we, we remember what we want to remember and forget what we want to forget at certain positions. And that's happened at BET or, or, you know, at Radio One. Like there was news. Black radio was community. You know, that mm-hmm. was the voice you can trust. And it's not the voice that you can trust anymore. It's just a voice. You know, nobody's listening for political news or local news. Everything's more on a national level. Now, is that is that because our appetite as, as consumers has changed, or 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 the size of the buffet table? Which one? Who's who do you lay that at the feet of? 
uh, the buffet table. Look, I tell stories like back in the day, and I, I know you know because you've been there, like a top record, you know, in the 80s, early 90s spun every three or four hours. Now it's every 60 minutes. You get that yeah. heavy dose of whoever's on top all the time, and you don't get that balance. So it's it's a smaller piece of the pie that we get to hear, but that's this traditionally how corporations run. You know, black radio for a long time was run by black folks. Right. <laughs> and when you look at these companies, the real decision makers ain't black. You know, I just got into uh, a, a thing about WAP with a local programmer at Cox who's white, who I love, I love him like a brother, but he mm-hmm. doesn't understand the same thing because, you know, I remember when I went to Jimmy Iveen's house who ran into Scope, you know, the, and they were the gangster label. When right. I went to his house in Jersey, yo, his kids were riding horses, and it's just a different feeling when you don't mm-hmm. have the experience of knowing the crack dealer or somebody's in jail, or seeing what it really does to your 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 community, and that's what I think gets lost when the suits at the table, you know, make all the decisions. Now that we've seen a a new era of consciousness really kind of take over the game, in, in, you know, in summer twenty twenty. I don't even know if there's a nickname for it yet, but just this collective wokeness that that we witnessed from from May to July. Um, you know, it, there was, there was kind of, there, there's room for change as far as the music is concerned. Do, do you think it will ever go back? You know, where, whereas we're waking up, you know, young people and millennials and, and, and whatnot and saying, you know what, that music, we, we got a soundtrack. Hip hop is like a soundtrack for murder right now. And that's not, that's not feeding us. You know what I'm saying? Do you think it will ever be a yeah. time where it will go back to the, the, uh, even it don't even have to be conscious, but a, a little bit more, uh, you know, stomachable with kids in the yeah. car. Do you think yeah, they'll go well, back to that? No, I don't. <laughs> uh, you know, I, <laughs> unless folks start talking up, because I, I see folks defending it all the time, you know. Mm-hmm. And I, mm-hmm. I know I heard you talking about WAP last week. And now people mm-hmm. look at songs like that as a liberation song. And, right. you know, that's just, that's a different type of liberation. You know, I call it a strip club song. I, I know right. where the place is, but if 80 percent of the song sound like, you know, and, and I expect nothing less from Cardi and Megan. That's cool. Right. But I, right. I just want some balance. There are no Chuck D's. There are no KRS ones. There's a J. Cole here and there. But, uh, you know, Kendrick Lamar, but for the most part, it's about beating a sister over the head and misogyny and all that. And I think it feels different, you know, when you're 10 years old or 15 years old hearing it. And when I was that young, I didn't hear those type of things. So yeah. when I see young young kids growing up, and this is the steady diet they get, I used to be mad at the kids, and that's sort of what turned my life around, you know? I was mm. mad at them for being so raunchy, and then I said, I'm taking part of it. There was, you mm. know, I was in New York in Hot 97, and there was this record by Raw Digger. Like, we used to date part songs, and the, 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 the chorus was, got to beat that bitch with the bat. And right. And a a 11-year-old came up to me at a school out in Queens crying about Mr. Paul. Can you get this record off the radio? And I read her note, and I said, what happened, Latia? And it's in the Mm. book. It's in the book. I said, what happened? She said, my mother got beat up by my father. He beat her with a bat, and she's in Roosevelt Hospital. And right then the light bulb went off. I went back to Hot 97 and Emmys Broadcasting, and I I told the story, and they they made a quick reaction. They pulled the songs off, and a week later, I was off the air. Wow. (laughs) They pulled, they got rid of me, and that's when I started my fight, you know, because the corporate heads were like, yo, we making money. And it's sort of like the drug dealer, you know, 
Yeah. They give out turkeys on Thanksgiving, but right. they ravage right, right, right. your community <laughs> the whole time. And that, right. that, that was my general manager's excuse and the owner's excuse. And the next thing I knew, I was on television, and here it is 20 years later. Well, yeah, 20 years later, I'm still fighting the same battles. Now, let's talk about that. How are you fighting? What are, what are you doing now that, that's, you know, got you in a position where you you able to put up that fight? To be independent, you know, mm. not to be a slave to a check. You know, I bought my own radio station. I, I, I get to speak freely. Is, is it the best of times always, you know, being in the forefront and taking a lead? No, but spiritually and mentally i feel better you know Mm -hmm. i i i know some of the fights i've gotten songs and shows taken off of mtv and uh, this different movements i started a non-profit with my partner lisa fager it's called industry years and i got a site called rap rehab and just educating you know and i get to do a lot of college lectures and talk to a lot of kids around the country and once mm. they find out how the business runs, they right. get it. You know, there was yeah. this great documentary by Byron Hurt. It's called Beyond Beats and Rhymes. And I think it's the best hip-hop documentary. It, it, I, I urge your audience to watch it. And it came out like 15 years ago, but it's still true that not rappers right. rap because what they hear on the radio. That's not their only story, but they think, to be down, they got to, you know, they got to be gangster, even though they're not. And I just want to make it cool so we can tell uplifting stories, too, to get some balance. And I love the gangster stuff. That's part of my life, too. I just don't want to hear it 85% of the time. And I don't want to just <laughs> yeah, target those right. kids. Yeah, exactly. And, and that's always been my gripe, even when I was there uh, in radio, um, years ago in music radio. And and my whole gripe was, yeah, it's, it's I... You know, I, I throw your guns in the air, Onyx. You know, ninety two, ninety three, uh, Wu Tang. You know, all the, like I was, I was there. I'm in it, and and I do want to uh, hear. But at the same time, you know, all day, every day, over free radio. Radio is a free medium. That's what people yeah. gets missed on a lot of people. It's a it's a free medium. So that means you really can't. You have no protection against it other than to change the channel. Most people out of habit, they're not changing the channel because that's what they want to hear. So you gotta, yeah. you know, you keep. I was just going to say, like, in the kid in the car, you know, in the mornings, you got the kids in the morning, you got, you know, it's just, it's it's not like, all right, movies are R-rated. Um, you're paying to go see that movie. It's not a free medium. So you can put whatever you want in it. But with commercial radio, specifically urban radio, specifically with white people in charge, I feel like it, we're, we're bombarded with the, with the negative vibe and that negative energy. And, and 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 we're so used to it generation generationally it's like no this is normal like this is what yeah. you know this is what we supposed to be this is how we are this is black people and and, and we don't but even you, know how much poison we putting in our own soul but but you know when the big change happened there was a time when black radio you could be in the car with kids and then they split it up they made urban adult contemporary and the oldies, and then they made the hip-hop. So uh, as some folks got older, they left one side, and their mm. kids listened to one thing, and as adults, adults listened to something else. And that's when it started to really get sour, you know? It mm. really got stupid, stupid. And, and you know, and, and there's nothing more impressionable than stardom, you know? So right. we see what stars, so, you know... Yeah, I hear more. There was the thong song, you know, 15 years ago, but every song talks about stripping and uh, anyway. Uh, and the thong, I know and look, the thong, the, the thong, yeah, you are. The thong song was light though. That was when you think about it. That was so light. You like oh. you wish you could have just a song about underwear now. <laughs> well, people were words, man. I, you know, yeah. I remember back in the day when people complained. You know, when I started in radio, I remember when the Isleys came out with Between the Sheets. That was mm. like a terrible lyric, <laughs> but it was right, so right. tastefully done. 
you know, D'Angelo yeah. had brown sugar, and that's a weed song. But right. now it's this, roll my blunt, stick it in your, it, it, you know, it, it, yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it's word plays not 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 available anymore. We're, we're joined by uh, Paul Porter, author of Blackout: My Forty Years in the Music Industry. Now, um, I wanted to talk briefly. Uh, one one thing I read in there it said. You were never actually fired from BET, but you were staying in a hotel and your accommodations just magically ended. <laughs> tell, tell, tell that story. Tell that story if you can. Well, well, at the time, man, they had brought over uh, who I still love. His name is Stephen Hill. And for years he ran BET and everything. And I don't know if it was, you know, a power move, but you know, for the last 60 days, I never saw him. He would run the other direction. <laughs> and it was this, <laughs> it, it's this typical, you know, uh, some people aren't confrontational, but I was in a hotel. I had a $45,000 bill. <laughs> you know, I was in a hotel <clears throat> short and they kept paying the bill and I thought it was crazy. And I found out through somebody else, I left, I took my computers and everything else from BET and never walked back in the building again. Wow. wow. But he knew the power in taking the money. You know, you can get rich programming networks. And, wow. You know, and and I saw the change when I left right away because all the garbage went back in and the same dumb messages and everything else. But, you know, he's in that film, Beyond Beats and Rhymes. They ask okay. him a question, <laughs> and Steven r runs off the camera because he knew he's wrong. And, and, wow. and that's why sometimes I point it out, man. Some, and I'm not perfect. I named all my failures in that book, too. I failed mm -hmm. like everybody else, but you got to take responsibility for it. Now, now the, some of the names that you mentioned, you know, your old counterparts or whatever, do they still do they still rock with you? Like knowing oh, yeah, how you know the position, yeah, yeah. It's funny when I first started, people were real quiet, you know. And over the years, I and it's not that I had some special foresight; I just had a little more kahunas than some folks, you know. And I, and once I got that second good job, you know, sometimes when people are in jobs, they get real quiet, you know, because they got to pay bills. But I learned I could recreate myself and do other things at other times. And, and now now's the perfect time. I got an app. Uh, it's called ConsciousCon. It's iOS and Android. You know, okay. I'm building my own messages, do my own my own thing and I don't I'm not a slave to Instagram or Facebook even though I use them all but right. you know I just think it's time that we need to build our own media and messages and I've got to work with some good people back from college Wendy Williams you know Joy Reed this this I I've been blessed to work with some of the best people in the business and build with them over the years and there's a lot of good people in it, but there's a lot of weak people too. Mm. What? So tell me, talk to me about uh, Conscious Con. What, what? What does that look like? What do I get from that? Conscious Con, man. Uh, there's this positive messages, man. You know, mm -hmm. from videos to like I do a live broadcast tonight at seven, and we talk about real things. And I, a lot of my stuff is geared music related. And, you know, I'm trying to deal and pass it on. You know, the uh, one thing that's kept me alive is keeping involved with younger people. You know, mm -hmm. uh, uh, Kiki D, a 22-year-old rapper at American U University, you know, or uh, or Suzanne Christine. I, I, I just can't stand. There's a difference between experience and expertise. And they mm -hmm. have a lot of folks that are older that don't get the younger side because mm. they want it to be the heyday back in the day. And it's changed. So if you're not yeah. listening to everybody, it's invalid, you know? And when you talk to these folks, when I go to colleges or 
the elementary schools, you know, I can talk on their level and they understand that they, they, they really do. Cause we got to do a better job of going back and forth and talking to people and younger people and telling our stories. Yeah. We don't do enough of that. Now, now speaking of that, and as we wrap up, give me, give me a good story. Give me one of your uh, more memorable uh, occasions from your 40 years in the, in the music business if, or a couple, give me a couple of them. Man, wow moments because I, I know you got them. <laughs> I know well, you got them. Matter, matter of fact, I, I, C-SPAN gave me a special on the book. If you look up Paul Porter and Blackout, I tell a lot of the stories. They gave me ninety minutes, but there was oh, wow. a time when I when I was in D.C. and um, you know, back early eighties, man, everybody was rolling back then. There was no. COVID, there was no poverty, and uh, everybody was getting high. So I, I I go to the local dope man's house, and I walk in, and I see on the couch, like, you open the door, and on the couch, there were three people. One was uh, Mayor Marion Barry, one was John F. Kennedy Jr., and the other was Jim Vance, who was probably the best black anchor in America and DC forever, forever. And they're all gone now. They wow. all have died. And, wow. you know, I, it, this, that moment stuck with me. And that's when I sort of got my head together. You know, I thought getting high was cool and doing this and all that. And I saw them sweating on the couch and, 45 minutes later, I had cocaine sweats, and that sort of started changing me and bringing me back because I was part of the I was part of the movement. I was just like soaking it up, you know. And you know, I went to D.C. I'm 24 years old, making 75 grand in 1982. You couldn't tell me anything, right, but, but once right. I started seeing people fall and talking to people, you. You, you you just get to learn. You you get to learn. And, and working with some of the... I went to Africa with Stevie Wonder on his first trip when I was at BET. We went to Cameroon. And, mm, nice. you know, even though I, I got a dumb Stevie Wonder story. Can I tell that? Yeah, you absolutely can. <laughs> what does that even mean? So we, <laughs> we're, uh, I, I'm in awe because I'm with Stevie Wonder and we're over there with a group of people from BET at the embassy and hanging out. And uh, Stevie calls me. And at the time, Cameroon was like the AIDS capital of the world. This is in 92. And we got to go to the hospitals and I threw up. And You know, all the guys on the crew, all the women spoke French there. But, you know, all the guys were, were making booty checks. And Stevie calls my room back at the time. That, that's when Magnum condoms were out. And I was like, <laughs> I don't want to have any sex in a- a- Africa. I was just in the hotel. And Stevie called me for a couple of condoms to come to his room. And I walked in, and Stevie had three beautiful women in there. And I was like, wow, I gave Stevie Wonder my condoms so i know that sounds <laughs> silly but it, it just sticks out you know i got to bring michael yeah. jackson on stage so oh, you wow. know okay. it, 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 there's been a lot of up times but i've also been broke you know when right. when they kicked me out in new york i was living in my bmw 635 csi because i didn't have new york money after i took a stand so, you know, there's a lot of pain, and the book talks about the ups and downs. Hmm. Well, there it is, ladies and gentlemen. Paul Porter, the book is Blackout, My 40 Years in the Entertain- in the Music Industry. Uh, hey, man, I you're, you're a giant in the game, uh, a mentor to a lot of people, a, a walking storyteller. I appreciate you coming on the show, man. Much appreciate. I wish you the best. Hey, man. Round of applause. Lamar, Paul Porter, you. ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for the shot. All right. All right.
I don't care if it is a closet. You're still looking mad at fish. 